the Be Here Now group. So I live and breathe. <laughs> <laughs> it's the penultimate wisdom. I mean, what did you, you had to wait. We weren't ready. We weren't ready. We've been preparing for you. <laughs> Get ourselves ready to be here now. <laughs> yes. Um, we, we were talking about how difficult it can be to be here now and live in the present, particularly within a culture that um, is very future oriented and that discourages things like faith and trust and using your intuition. Um, so we just wonder if you could give us some practical ideas how we could, you know, cultivate being here now within all that. Well, you can see the way in which almost all of the spiritual practices are designed to bring you into the moment. That when you're like doing Tai Chi with David, at first um, you're thinking about it, but after a while, each movement is a fixed moment in which you are right where that moment is, that movement is. And in a way, when Tai Chi is working, you die into it. And then the moment is just the movement of the hand at that point. Similarly, um, in devotional practice, when you love, you start with romantic, dualistic, I love you, and it's self-conscious love, and it's aware that you are loving. The concept of loving is very present. But as the love starts to intensify, that kind of self-consciousness disappears. And there is just the fullness of the state of love. And again, love brings you into the present moment. You're in the present moment in love. When we are together in love, there is the fullness of the moment. And you can feel it when you fall in love with somebody that the falling has all the drama around it, but the state of being with the person, you can feel the timelessness of the moment. Because the fullness of be here now has the future and the past in it. It is not exclusive of that. People think, oh, you're being here now, you're not being responsible, in the sense that responsible means time binding over past and future. But all the past and the future, everything you always were is in this moment. And all of your commitments for the future are in this moment. And the fullness of this moment includes everything. It doesn't exclude. It doesn't exclude past and future. All we're dealing with is the problem that the human mind clings. And the, the clinging of the human mind takes it into time and into space, and it takes it away from the fullness of the moment. So that the most exquisite practice, like the practice of Vipassana, in which one keeps extricating oneself from identification with thoughts about past and future by notice, noting them and then coming back to the present moment. And the breath, which at first is just, the reason the breath is so good to work with is it's always around and it's right there and it's easy. You don't have to carry it with you. You don't, have, it wasn't in your other pants or anything like that, you know. <laughs> it's always around. You can get it. It's in supermarkets everywhere. There's always breath and you can always just, I mean, I do that all the time. I'm in traffic. Somebody's just cut me off and I feel that something, you know, the thought forms arising and I just start to follow my breath as I'm driving and I can feel that at first I'm busy with my anger and busy with my driving and then after a little while, the breath, I start to really hear the breath and as I hear the breath, I come back and then as I hear the breath, I note the hand on the steering wheel and then I note the emotions and I just keep coming back into the thicker and thicker richness of this moment. So as a practical, these are all techniques for coming into the moment through the heart, through energy, through meditation, and um, the beauty of working like some of the exercises we do with your focus with another person is that another person can bring you into the moment also. 
but it's got to be intense enough. Like when we do the interviews where people focused and looked into my eyes, it's interesting. People who aren't used to that, they come in and they start to tell you about their problems. And I've got this real problem and they're looking there or in the papers or something and their eyes flick up to you every now and then. You're just sitting there, you know, like. And then after a while, their eyes flicker a few more times and they kind of look at you a little sheepishly and then quiet down, quiet down until they sort of settle in. The eyes vibrate and then they settle. There's a lot of blinking and then it slows down. And then you're just watching. It's like a butterfly landing. It's exquisite. Right? And then because people aren't used to looking in each other's eyes, except Meshuggah to people like us, but most people aren't. And you don't do it in a, I'm here, are you looking at me or come on, look at me, or you don't do it as a power thing. You're just sort of sitting there. People's eyes flicker, and then they come in here. And s when the eyes make contact, not in a social form, not are you here, I'm here, hi, hello in there, but just the presence, it becomes an immense experience of the moment. It becomes very full. And suddenly you are pulled out of your mind, you're pulled out of your plans, you're pulled out of your questions, you're just pulled into the fullness of the moment. And when you're around somebody that is in the fullness of the moment, it pulls you in too. And that's part of what the richness of a guru is about. Are you a shill? <laughs> I'm a shill for My God, next yes. Question. <laughs> it's just from what you were saying. Because when I'm with another person, it's very easy for me to be present. Or when I'm in a beautiful, stimulating place. But when I'm just by myself, I don't know where I am, but I'm I'm gone a lot of the time. And so that's my hmm. question. Hmm. Well, most of the time we're living in our minds. We're living in memories, plans, reflections, um, judging. And the mind is just continually presenting thoughts and we're buying them and then identifying with them. And then we're, we lose the moment into the, we're just off with the thought. We're not there at all. And uh, um, often um, I, I keep training myself so that like um, in my, uh, my, my little house, uh, dishes have to be done. And when I start to do the dishes, I can feel the difference from when I start to do the dishes from when I end doing the dishes. When I start to do the dishes, I'm busy. I got to do the dishes so I can get back to my desk or I got to make that phone call. I better do the dishes first. And then as I start to do the dishes, an interesting experience. I was at a Benedictine monastery some years back. We couldn't talk. It was a silent. I guess it was, um, yeah, it was Benedictine. Yeah. And it was silent. And um, the only time you ever talked was when you were in line to wash your tin plate. You were standing and you could sort of whisper. I mean, it was sort of a funny little kind of hole in the system. It was a loophole. And I was, there was a um, man in front of me and he had a brush with a soap on it and he was washing his tin plate. And I was looking over his shoulder and I said to him, because he only had a moment to talk, I said, how long have you, and the life was very simple and very repetitious. I said, how long have you been here? And he said, 17 years. And there was a quality in the term 17 years and the tone of voice he said it in and that brush going around in that plate that was so profound a moment for me of a certain kind of surrender, a certain kind of peacefulness, a certain kind of just washing the plate. And it's interesting because when I pick up the brush and put the soap in it, you know, squirt the dove or whatever it is in a little glass filled with water and stick it in and start to rub the plate, there it is again. And I start out washing the dishes to get done. And by the time I'm done, I'm so high from washing the dishes. It's interesting because at Barry, um, I really got bugged at this retreat because Sam came and got, he came to wash pots and um, he didn't end up, he didn't end up washing pots. Either. Because my job at Barry has always, at the retreat center has always been, I always sign up to wash pots. And people, they come in, they see me washing pots and they think, oh, poor Ram Dass, he's got this dirty, heavy job. But I'm just washing these pots and others have to sit and meditate and I'm just washing these pots. <laughs> <laughs> so you can take your moments and use 
train yourself to keep coming back in by just doing what you're doing. Very often when I'm driving, I'm busy going somewhere until I think, where am I? Just the question, where am I? Well, I'm driving. My hands are on the steering wheel. My foot's in the accelerator. And then go in deeper. And the my disappears. And there's just hands on the steering wheel and foot in the accelerator and passing images. And you just keep using everything to come back into the moment. Yeah. Questions? I feel like you've already... Um, touched on this in many different ways. Um, the question from the group was, how can you come from a heartfelt space rather than, rather than from your head when implementing Be Here Now? Well, it's interesting to reflect about what we're talking about, a heart space. And that's why um, it's interesting the way this, this uh, third patriarch is titled um, it's the uh, Sin Sin. Sin, it's, it's sang, spelled Sang Stan here, but Sin Sin, Sin Sin, which is the Heart Mind Sutra. Uh, because if you explore, when you are feeling the fullness of the presence of the moment. Like this moment with the river in the background and the movements in the room, my voice, and your bodies and the feelings of your body on the floor or the chair. And the thoughts pouring through your mind. birds, and you get quieter and keep just letting the sensations arise and pass away, what is the quality of the heart? It isn't a heavy emotional quality of, of loving or hating or, or much intense emotion, but it's a quality of um, soft presence. Of, uh, of inclusiveness and um, it feels to me very much like a heart space it's not an emotional space but it's a very much of a deep heart space it's where the quietness of the mind and the heart come together I was impressed I don't, I don't know that I mentioned this week I may have I don't quite remember but um, 12 years ago, or 15 years ago, or 18 years ago, I think I did mention it, when I used to meditate, uh, uh, do Vipassana, I'd end up very dry. And now when I meditate, I end up very moist, very soft. And I realize that I'm appreciating the meditation practice from a different place now. And at first I used to accuse the practice of being dry. Now I see it was me who was doing the practice, but I didn't know that at the time. Because now I end up, when I do the practice, I end up closer to Maharaji than when I started the practice, even though the practice doesn't believe in gurus and God and all that stuff. So I think that we, as long as you're talking about the heart space as just being that quality of boundaryless, soft presence and fullness, the quieter your mind, the more that keeps and the more you're just here, here. And appreciating the richness of the moment. I mean, it's interesting when you read um, uh, the writings of people. We um, we've had a prison project going for a number of years, and uh, a lot of these men and women that are in prison live in a very small cell, you know, six by ten or something like that, and they live years this way, and they write stuff that is so rich, I mean, in the same way that Genet did, uh, that you feel it allows you, I mean, when I've been in cells meditating, like when I was in Burma a few years ago, two months just meditating, there was at my window a spider, 
And I got to know that spider so well. And I got to know the way the spider was weaving its web and how the wind affected it and how the rain affected it and what kind of food it ate. And the whole quality of the wall and the graininess of the color of the, and the color of the wall and the way it had been whitewashed in, uh, not very well in, in certain corners. And I sent, went from a state of boredom into just opening to the incredible richness of the humdrum nature of phenomena, just the, the thickness of what was all the time, the quality of the air. I had it figured out for how long I'd be there, and I could have two M&Ms a day. And so I always had my two M&Ms just at the last thing before 12 noon, because I wasn't going to eat till the next morning. And so I bring out the two M&Ms, and I place them down, thing, and I get myself into a meditative space, and I get all comfortable, and then I pick up one M&M, and I study it, and I, I take half of the M&M. I wouldn't eat the whole M&M, you know. And you let it melt. I mean, it's got peanut in it, too. These were the peanut kinds, so that you, you get the sweet and the salt, and I just go through the whole thing. And by the time I finished the second m M&M, I was... I had had so much M&M, I never wanted to see it again until the next day. I mean, it was so rich and thick and full, and it was just two little m and Now, I mean, you know, when I'm less conscious, I can scoop up a, you know, like that, and they're, they're, all, they're gone. But in a way, I kept slowing down and slowing down and slowing down, and the richness of everything about me got thicker and thicker and thicker. I mean, like Elizabeth Barrett Browning or people like that, you, you just feel the richness of the moment. And you feel how you cheat yourself by being in your mind and being so heavily scheduled into then and then and then. What I'll do, who I'll become, and missing this, missing this. I mean, if you heard this message, the drive home tomorrow will be as rich as the sitting here. That... There's nowhere to go, because every moment of life, no matter where you are, is equally as rich. It's just got so much stuff you haven't examined yet. I was taught a lot by Aldous Huxley, who uh, was a very dear and wonderful person, and we hung out together a little bit. I mean, I couldn't really understand most of what he was talking about, because he was much too smart for me. But And the cute image I have of him all the time was we were in Copenhagen, and um, we were walking through the street, and uh, he was nearly blind, but he could see the colors. And so he's very aware of the colors of lights of different countries, like he talked about Spain as having a certain quality of light. And uh, we were walking down the street, and a, a horse had uh, left his, um, his calling card on the ground. And so I said, um, Aldous... Be careful, uh, you know, there's some horse shit there. And all this stopped, and he looked at it. I don't know what he saw, and he said, Extraordinary! <laughs> <laughs> and that struck me for some reason. I mean, that's like 17 years, you know. <laughs> Extraordinary, you know. Because everything he looked at, because the way he could see the universe, he saw, he saw, like, um, I think it was Selman Waxman, the doctor who had invented penicillin or whatever it was, that used to start his medical lectures by reaching in his pocket and bringing out some horseshit and describing how in that was all of the stuff that they were going to be study for the whole course. And it's as if you see in the most trivial stuff the most profound. I mean, those of you that have taken acid and been by anything, I mean, <laughs> there was a moment when I was doing a book on LSD uh, back in the 60s and um, with uh, Sidney Cohen, who was the good guy, he worked for the FDA and I was the bad guy. And we had all these pictures we had that this photographer had done and Sidney picked all the pictures that made LSD. I mean, they're all pictures of people going like this and, you know, and... You know, and I picked all the pictures of people making love in fields and playing the flute and things like that. And there was one picture both of us picked. And it was a picture of a guy in a kitchen lying on the floor 
and there was a bottle of Coca-Cola that was spilled, and there was a big puddle of Coca-Cola, and he was looking at it, see? <laughs> see? And Sidney picked it as a demonstration of the trivialness of mind when you were a drugged state, see? And I picked it to show that in everything is everything. I mean, in that spilled Coca-Cola was the entire universe, because I've seen it, you know? So what's boredom about after that? Boredom is just lack of attention. Uh, question. Who's next? Oh, I'm next. <laughs> I'm not here Be now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like you've answered this in many ways okay. all through the time. Um, but while we were talking, the group kept talking about how they don't trust the net they don't trust that what they're doing here is going to be enough to get them to point B and so they and I find that I'm continually trying to control this moment to get to wherever so can you please speak on that psychological concern <laughs> yes I can <laughs> um Observation will show you that when you arrive at a new situation, the optimum strategy for dealing with that situation is to quiet down and hear the totality of it and hear all of the variables and how they're all working together just in a quiet, intuitive way out of which will come an optimum action. That is, the fully you are present in that moment of choice, the more you will, you can expect an optimum response, optimum in the sense of in the deepest harmony in the most planes of reality. The best practice for being in the moment at that moment is to practice being in the moment in this moment. Since your planning for that situation is missing the existential components that will exist in that situation that don't exist now, you are planning in the absence of all the data. For example, I can plan that I'm going to give a lecture next Thursday night, but I don't know that whether I, what I have for dinner that night is going to affect my consciousness in a way that's going to make that lecture other than the one I plan now. And what I'm going to do Thursday evening when I'm sitting with that audience is very much a function of what has gone on that day and what's, what's, what I've eaten and what happens in the hall and who comes to the lecture and all that. And the, my plans, the minute I make a plan now for then, what will happen is when I get there, if I'm so wedded to the plan I had then, I do violence to what the existential moment is in order to impose my plan at that time. And we're all used to doing that all the time. We're all used to having plans and then our, in, in, our inertia of mind, our inability to let go of our plan into the new moment leaves us strangely out of sync with everything and doing violence to the whole thing. Like you meet somebody and you have a model of a romance and then you meet them again, and the situation offers something entirely different than what you thought it was going to be, but your model, you can't let go of your model, and you end up destroying what new thing could be because you can't hear it, because your your attachment to your old model. After you begin to observe that phenomenon occurring again and again, that way in which that you have to make plans, but you just hold very lightly to them, and always realize that the fullness of being in this moment, which includes the future and the plans, but the fullness of this moment is the best preparation for when that time is here now. Okay, So being here now is the best preparation for when you are there then. Okay, Or where, when, you're, when there then is here now. Now, this is particularly... Um, um, vivid in Eastern thought where 
where, which has reincarnation as a uh, a root assumption, because in under in those traditions, the moment of death is seen as such a significant moment, because where your mind is as you leave this incarnation has a lot to do with the the sort of vector forces that will determine where you go in the next round. So that well, understanding that, much of the work you do on yourself in this life is in preparation to, at that moment of death, be fully present, not clinging or aversion. They describe a very, very high monk who was, who was very, very beautiful, had done so much work, and at the moment of his death, a beautiful deer passed in the distance, and he looked with attachment. I mean, just with the delight, and with a, his mind went out there, and there was a whole birth, just for that one thought form. And remember that story of Maharaji in Miracle of Love, where he was sitting on the side of the road uh, near a little temple, and they ate, and they all went to bed around 11 o'clock at night, around uh, 1 in the morning. He got up and he said, I want, he started screaming, I want chapatis and dal, I want chapatis and dal. And they said to him, Baba, you already ate. And he said, I want chapatis and dal, I want chapatis and dal. And, you know, they, in India, the way it is, is who can understand the guru? You know, that's the sort of the philosophy. So they got up, and they made the fire, and they cooked the dal, and they made the chapatis, and it was already at 2 o'clock. And he ate like he never saw food before. And then they all went back to bed, and they wouldn't have thought anything more of it. The next day at around 10 o'clock in the morning, a telegram arrived saying that down on the plains, which was about, oh, 100, 150 miles away from where he was, an old one of his devotees had died at 2 in the morning. And he said, see, he just said almost like an afterthought, see, that's why I wanted the chapatis and doll. See, and of course, they didn't see any more than you see. And, and, but it, <laughs> see, it awakened their curiosity. And so they started to bug him about it. And after about two or three days, like he's talking to children, he says, don't you understand? As he was dying, he wanted chapatis and doll. And I didn't want him to have to take another birth just for that one. <laughs> see? So he just took it on. He just, he had the chapatis and doll. I mean, that's a very weird and far out story. But I, the reason I tell it to you is to play with that issue that where you are at the moment of death has to do with what goes on next. And in view of that and because of that preoccupation, there is a way of looking at all spiritual practice as preparation for your moment of death. Now, at the moment of death, when the mind, when the information systems start to dissolve, I mean, in the Tibetan Buddhist system, they describe it beautifully. They say, um, the earth element leaves and you feel heaviness. Then the water element leaves and you feel dryness, thirst. Then the fire element leaves and you feel coldness. Then the air element leaves and the out-breath is longer than the in-breath. Now, you, I, I've been around many dying people, and it's interesting how when the water element leaves, they'll say, I'm thirsty. Now, if they're trained properly, they'll say, ah, there's thirst, the water element's leaving. Versus, I'm thirsty, which will preoccupy them with getting water, which will start a whole process, because everybody around them is trying to help them, you know, through this thing, you want water here, here's water, and they get all preoccupied with it. If they die at that moment, that's where they're going. Probably end up a fish or something. <laughs> okay. Okay. I know some of you find this too flip, but that's because you think it's serious. I mean, death is the, is the drama going in town that everybody buys into, so I mean, I, I treat it rather flipply. Um, and so you begin to appreciate why people prepare so that at... It's like, you know, the monk that's dying and he... You're supposed to write your death poem. This, these are my old stories. And, and they, the students are freaked because he hasn't written his death poem. They say, you haven't written your death poem. He says, oh. And he picks up his pen and he calligraphies madly and he dies. 
It says, birth is thus, death is thus. Verse or no verse, what's the fuss? <laughs> and it's just such a, yeah. There's a certain quality of lightness into, ah, another moment, because death is just another moment. But the minute you're pushing or grabbing, it propels you in a certain direction. You can feel it in your own, because each moment is a death and birth in which you can feel being propelled by your attractions and aversions. So that the, in a way, the whole Eastern strategy is practicing to be here now so that when it really hits the fan, you'll be here now. Because it's like a huge acid trip dying. I mean, when it's all dissolving and your mind doesn't work so well and everything's getting kind of weird and it's all changing. And this is where change really becomes apparent and to keep equanimity in the presence of change. It's good to practice in advance. Yeah. A microphone. Yeah. Huh? All right. Um, there's, there's a sort of funny contradiction to that in that it, what your answer sort of fed into what I believe in that there's a good purpose for doing this now because it will get you what you want. That's right. The best thing to plan for the future is to be in the present. Yes. Um, a lot of us are doing a um, putting a lot of effort into being more fully present and to being here now. And like in the Rumi poem, we head towards the fire, but our heads have not yet come up in the water. Um, and in the process, I know for myself, I lose my sense of humor. And uh, I'm wondering if you could talk about ways of taking care of ourselves in the process. See, now, if I were in my more Zen state, I'd say, take care of who? Which self do you want to take care of? And I'd start, I just take it obliquely right out of that question, because that is a psychological question, you know, that is like, here's this little self trying to do good and get enlightened. Poor thing. It should take a vacation. It should go to Hawaii and maybe surf a little. You know, not to do it too heavy, because it's hot, you know, in the fire and... No rush, and I should say nice things that make you feel comfortable. Right? There's another part that says just go deeper into the fire. If you really want to take care of yourself, burn, baby, burn. I mean, it's really, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm showing you the different levels of the way this whole discourse could be going and from where it could be going. I'll tell you, I, uh, from where I'm at in this place, which you will understand because we're all sort of playing this one together, uh, I would say that um, um, in 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 the Buddhist tradition. Uh, in the Theravadan Buddhist tradition, they, um, the Pali doctrine suggests that because a human birth is so precious and so rare, and it's so precious because all the components are necessary for the work of liberation, that you should not waste a moment and you should work just as hard as you can and make real effort and not let a moment go by. Um, I do not experience that as true. I mean, it's true probably, and I'm just not ready to experience it. I don't have the sense of urgency about spiritual practice. Um, I have a feeling of the rightness of the unfolding, and I really have a deep sense of patience about it all and relaxed. So uh, I time the whole process. I feel a rhythm in the work. And I'll make really intense effort, and then I will pull back, and then I'll do other things for a while, and play and light and be in the world. Now, as my spiritual awareness grows, I can feel that the pulling back is as much work as the, what I thought was doing the heavy work. It all becomes the same stuff. 
So after a while, there really isn't any way to pull back. You can't take a vacation from a spiritual journey. So when you say how to be kind to yourself, be gentle with yourself. Uh, certainly you should examine things like guilt because you're not working hard enough, all the oughts and shoulds you drive yourself on ruthlessly with, all the feelings you're not enough as you are and that you ought to be more spiritual or more conscious of something than you are. I think just an appreciation of the perfection of the universe, which includes you, that you have a right to exist just the way you are and you're at the absolutely optimum place at this moment. And that if you were fully enlightened, you wouldn't have taken birth here in the first place. That this isn't an error. You are not an aberration. You're not an error. You're not somebody's mistake. Nobody blew it. No matter how bizarre you feel like from inside. And to just appreciate that it is an unfolding process. You are your curriculum. This is the curriculum. I mean... Baldness was more part of my curriculum. <laughs> Having to watch my weight all the time because of this sort of tire around my belly, that's part of my curriculum. Dealing with these issues about retreats, that's my curriculum. And there's a certain way of appreciating and allowing and acknowledging what is that makes me very gentle with myself. That's the way I'm gentle with myself. Um, we can discuss this a little bit in the group, and I feel compelled to ask his question now. Um, what is it that is so attractive about being in the past and being in the future that supersedes the need or the want or the desire to be here now? Well, it's probably a combination. There is the unsatisfactoriness of the present conditions. And there is the karma of the attachments and aversions to the past and future. There is the attachment to the fantasy in the future of rather living in the fantasy than with what you've got now. So that you, it's like hell is paved with good intentions. That you're constantly creating models of how it's all going to come out and who you'll be which is more comfortable to live as the person who's planning to change and planning to do this and planning to be successful and planning to do all that thing than it is being fully what you are and facing what you are at this moment. And the rehearsing the past is often the, um, the security. It, it's often uh, rehearsing reinforcements you received in the past that keep um, um, it's reassuring it's reassuring to the existence of the separate entity most of the thoughts you have are usually thoughts that in some way legitimize an image of yourself that you're trying to preserve it keeps placing it keeps shoring up the walls of a self-concept it's called time binding, where you, you keep cultivating an image of yourself as an existing entity through constantly rehearsing the past and planning the future. And that keeps giving you a support for the image of who you think you are at any moment. So in a way, it keeps reassuring you that the prison cell you're in is real, when it, of course it is illusory. It's just, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. Uh, what is the in, when you're going into like a, making a a, a project, a, a five year plan for setting up a business or something like that, drawing on past mistakes, looking into the future, how can you be here now? In this present moment, you're making a plan. 
And that plan involves contracts. It involves uh, commitments to other people for a long-term plan. You're dealing with the existential situation at this moment, which includes the future and your expectations and so on. So in the fullness of this moment, you make this contract. We agree we're going to do this for five years. Now, a year later, a new moment. The fullness of that present moment includes that contract. That's part of that present moment. A present moment includes everything in all directions that exists. When you keep emptying all of the conditions that exist, right? for me, for example, that I am in a 58-year-old body is coloring the way in which my everything else is working in my life. It's different than if I, when I was in a 50-year-old body, I can feel it. I can feel a thing changing. And this is all has to do with future as it affects the present moment. Now, you can plan for the future. I mean, somebody calls me and says, can I see you next Tuesday at 2? And I look in my book and I say, yeah, well, at 2. Now, am I not being in the moment because I'm thinking about the future? The moment is the telephone call, the book, the pencil, the time, the plan in my mind. I'm still here with this whole situation. And next Tuesday, the existential situation will be that in the date book will be that and the telephone will be ringing that the person's present. Right, and that'll be that moment. Am I dealing with it, the question, or do you feel not, can't you get hold of it or what? Yeah, well, that's about what I got, too. <laughs> <laughs> Sam? It's the, it, or saying it another way is keeping the witness going that you're aware of your planning and it's the question is how attached you are like sometimes when you're planning for something you lose that consciousness so completely you are in the future moment you're not in the present anymore but there is a way of planning for the future where you're right here you can tell when you're planning for something and somebody comes into the room and you startle it's because you lost you were so busy in your thought you lost the moment in the moment you're perfectly here all the time even as you're planning and it doesn't detract from it either yeah next question my question deals with uh, integration in uh, redesigning my life one of the things that i would like to deal with is the fact that i seem torn between my work life my home life my spiritual life my personal life while i'm at work the needs of home drags on me and so on and so forth what i would like to feel is well, i suppose at home in all places that, that one isn't dragging the other hmm. Hmm. As you study the, um, the way in which your mind works and as you see the way in which a concentrated mind deals with the world as opposed to a diffused mind, um, you see the way in which that this lack of integration or this lack of um, being able to be at the office when you're at the office and at home when you're at home reduces your effectiveness in each of them. You do understand that. <clears throat> and... Um, When you stand back and examine your life, you see that the moments when you have been fully at home, like I notice that there was a stage where I was always time binding, where when I was here with you, I was anticipating the fact that Saturday I'll be at the temple, Sunday I'll be flying to California, Monday I'll be with Creating Our Future, Wednesday I'll be with the teachers, then I'll be in Europe. And I mean, I could, I was always, it was all real at this moment. And I constantly had the sequencing of where I came from and where I was going 
in my mind. So I was always planning and anticipating, and it kept... Um, What's changed now is that much more of the time, not just, I mean, I'm a long way away from being cooked, but much more of the time when I am here, this is it, I am here. And when I'm not here, I'm not here. And it's interesting how when you give another human being, your family or your business, the fullness of your being at any moment, a little is enough. Well, when you give them half of it, because you're time binding with your mind, there's never enough. And you begin to hear the secret that being fully in the present moment is the greatest gift you can give to each situation. That when I'm walking up, going to the bathroom, and I meet somebody in the path, and they say, have you got a minute? Now, unless I've got diarrhea, I probably have a minute. And I say, yeah. And then I turn to them, and at that moment, I'm not somebody going to the bathroom listening to their question. I'm just right here. And that takes me less time to deal with that thing fully so that they, I hear them fully, and they hear me hearing them, and we do the communication, than if I keep holding on to, yeah, sure, but I'm always thinking about going to the bathroom while I'm listening to the question. And it's taken me a while to learn how to that if I'm going to offer the gift of my being, it means offering the fullness of the moment in. And the feeling that I'm not doing enough at home when I'm at work ends up ending up you don't do enough at work and you don't do enough at home. While if you did your work fully when you're at work and your home fully when you're at home, and that's by standing back enough in that awareness to see the pieces of your life and see I have, I mean, it really those little books that have uh, my week in it, my week planners, I guess they're called, where you stand back and you see what's in your life. I see that I'm working on a book. I see that I have some AIDS patients. I see that I have, um, I've got Seva. I see that I've got my relationships. I see that I've got the teenage creating our future. I see that I've got the retreats. I see that I've got to rest. I see, I see the sort of pattern of my life. And I look and I realize, well, I've overextended. I've got too many things. So I'll have to start to work towards cutting back till I've got a number that I can handle. Then I see that each one will take so much time. And I get a kind of a, I stand back and I allow those moments when I sort of see the web and the pattern of it all. Like, I'll make a list of all the things I'm involved in, in life. Just all the different things. And then I'll look and I'll say, do they create a life, first of all, that is fulfilling my unique opportunities in the universe? Am I understanding each of them as part of my spiritual path? Because that's what my business is about. Is each one appropriate? Do I want to phase it out or do I want to keep it? Should it take a bigger part of my life? I stand back and I get a feeling of the design of my life. And once I'm at peace with the design of my life, then when I'm at each thing, the other part of me that's already stood back and seen the design of it is at peace. And then I can fully be in the thing I'm in. Right? It's when it's in, undigested and you don't stand back and get that perspective about it that you are constantly feeling you're not doing this when you're doing that. Do you hear what I'm trying to say? So I'm just giving you a little plan of action. One is cultivating the spacious awareness that sees the whole thing before you. And the other is the practice of when I'm here, if I do this when I'm here, this is the best gift I can do to this. The best gift you can do to everything that's going to come up in your life in the future is to do what you're doing at this moment fully. Because that's the training to be fully present in the moment, which is the best gift you give each situation. So the best gift you can give to your family when you're at work is to be at work. Am I dealing with a question? Okay, next one. If you could elaborate on how we can integrate a task or goal orientation 
with a receptive, intuitive approach to life. Uh, in the third patriarch, um, the first line, the great way is not difficult for those who have no preferences. Um, as I study that, it doesn't mean you don't have preferences. It means you are not clinging to your preferences. But you make all, uh, all your actions are based on preferences at one level or another, but you are not identified with that level. So the level at which there is task it's the same issue of impeccability. The level at which you function as a task-oriented being um, is different from the level of the intuitive heart-mind or the sin-sin. And um, they, they start to interplay and they have to do with that answer I gave the other day about consistency and truth. Because the intuitive wisdom is embracing of all the phenomena, the gestalt of what is historically and existentially present at the moment. And it takes all of it in and gives you the most appropriate response. Now, a task orientation which comes really out of the analytic mind, then plans a, it plans a strategy. And you start to act out that strategy. And often what happens is, in order to act out a strategy, you think you have to close down your intuitive wisdom. But if you keep them open, the only problem with keeping, them, keeping it open at the same time as you're carrying out the task is that it might make you inconsistent. That is, you might start the task, and then after some time, the intuitive gestalt shows you that it is no longer the optimum behavior. And the interesting question for many of us is how you've designed your life to allow for the minimum amount of inertia between the time that you realize you're intuitively off the wall and you're willing to stop the behavior. And the predicament is most of us live in a world of lock-in where everybody expects you to be consistent, carry out tasks, to complete them and all. So you find yourself living with an awful lot of inertia. Now, how you deal with that, that is part of the existential situation that the intuitive wisdom understands. Well, this is really, bleh, I, 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 could, I just barely can get there. Um, so the art form is, to the extent that you can, you design your life in a way that allows for maximum flexibility, that you can change in midstream as you're able to do. And you could... To the extent that you can, you surround yourself with people that can handle that. And you surround yourself with life work that allows for that. Now, to the extent that you have made commitments and contracts and entered into expectations with other people, then for you to be inconsistent does violence to those things, which in itself creates new karma that you then have to deal with. And that's all part of the intuitive wisdom. So that there is a point where even though you see that where you're going is no longer, it's sort of the result of an old calcified idea that you had a while back that you're living out now and you're caught in your old mind, the inertia of the system demands that you keep going in it for a while to complete it honorably. And then that becomes your spiritual sadhana at that point, your practice, to be able to stay in it. Like I came out of the 60s, I didn't come out of it, I was already old in the 60s, but uh, I'm a, I was an uncle of the 60s, and in the, in the 60s, we all had the feeling of, you know, live in the, be here now, we called it, and live in the moment and change as fast as you want to change, and uh, just uh, run it up the flagpole, see who salutes it, you know, let's just do what is, means um, uh, the, the right thing at this moment. And um, the idea is like... Um, sustainability or persistence or patience or continuity were the establishment words. They weren't the words of the New Age. The New Age were, you're with a person as long as it feels good and if it doesn't, screw it, you know. And so it changed a lot of social patterns. And uh, when I became involved in SEVA, um, I was still that person. And uh, it was very exciting to start a, a, a program. And then after five years, when it turned out that we had taken on 
to help eradicate blindness in Nepal. And there, there was still a lot of blindness in Nepal. We were five years down the path. And I thought, my God, I'm sucked into this game. I can't get out. I kept saying to everybody, I think I'll quit. I think I've had enough. And then I had to face the fact that I had, that this was an opportunity for me to learn other qualities of life. That freedom wasn't external freedom. Freedom was internal freedom. And that I was confusing my freedom to shift games with freedom. When I was trapped with a model about what rush I needed from the life that made me want to shift all the time. And that actually I've learned from a lot of people that live in very strict form and are free within form. Not free because they push away form. And I have been learning how to be free in form rather than being free from form and realize that freedom is the freedom to be in form without railing against it and to be able to move in and out of planes so that I can have be part of Seva as the continuity of a project that supports Dr. V and supports Nepal and supports Guatemala and do it every year and raise the money and do the thing as best I can and at the same moment be free within it. And that if I rushed up, because I spent years, hey, I'd rather be in Bali. So I'd go to Bali. And then I'd be just as neurotic in Bali as I was in Boston. And I think, well, what I really need is to be in southern Italy. So I go to southern Italy. Well, what I need is really a love affair in, you know, and I go do that. And I go do that. And what I really need is, an, you know, and I'd keep, I think I need to be accepted by, and I do that. And I kept running from here to here until I saw, I remember I was in Japan in a, in a uh, zendo and uh, we used to read a uh, Hakuin's prayer every morning and aloud, like we do the meta meditation. And one of the lines is, your coming and going is nowhere but where you are. And there I was in Japan on my way from India back to the States. Your coming and going is nowhere but where you are. And I started to sense that there's a place in me where there's no coming and going. I mean, I get on the plane and the plane flies its heart out and then I end up here and I'm still here. Where did I go? And that was the meaning of be here now. Where could you go anyway? And once I started to realize that, going everywhere and collecting more experiences started to lose its power over me. I mean, I'm not as, I, there's a little cynical edge at times when I don't have it purely in mind, because each thing is fresh and new, somebody will say, hey, come and look at the sunset. And I feel like saying, I've seen a sunset. You know, but you don't do that, because it's a new sunset. But then you begin to see that you don't have to keep collecting experiences. That it's all inside you, it's enough. You can be with enough. And working out of enoughness instead of need for more is a great art form, great art form. Questions? I keep running around. Yeah, every airport has a pretty picture of another city. Isn't that great? Yeah, yeah, it's all a travel agent. And it's interesting because they say, you know, like, I can't stand New York, it brings me down. Or big cities. But what brings you down are your desires that are latent seeds that get fanned by those billboards and posters and come-ons and want this and desire that and, and all that. Once you have consumed that stuff in you and you're peaceful... Then you can be in cities, and it's just like you're in a cave in the Himalayas. What difference does it make? If you want something, it all turns into discrimination of, I prefer this to that. Once you go beyond that, you don't have to prefer anything. You take what you're given. Are there any methods to deepen one's appreciation of the ordinary, to not take it all for granted, but somehow make sacred our ordinary experience. Mm, that's nice. In a way, just continually asking that question is almost enough because it allows you to look freshly at what is. The problem is that we get so caught in the habits of mind, we can't look freshly again. And as you extricate yourself from those patterns of thought, 
you look at everything freshly and it's all as if it's just, look, I am making all things new. It's just all emerging and it's all very precious and very beautiful and very fresh and very new. I think that we have also not invested in rituals that allow us to affirm the beauty of what is natural to us all the time. Uh, rituals around stages of life, rituals around changes in nature like uh, solstices and rituals around uh, fertility, rituals around harvest, rituals around <clears throat> eating, rituals around um, resting, rituals around um, planets, rituals around gathering together. Um, we don't, uh, we don't invest in making it sacred. We keep profaning it into our own uh, greed of I want that, I desire that. Um, I think when a group comes together and gets very quiet inside, they start to be interested in creating rituals. The predicament with rituals is what is a technique for awakening you to the freshness one moment, a le moment later is an institution that puts you to sleep and that's lost its juice. As Gurdjieff said, an alarm clock that wakes you one moment, you can sleep right through later on. And most of the rituals that we are find abhorrent were rituals that at one time were rituals that awakened people. And so you have to ke sort of keep recreating them over and over again is really what's required. It involves slowing down. I mean, when you read, like I remember reading books by uh, Anne Morrow Lindbergh, in which there's just such an appreciation in so many of those books of poets that just appreciate the fullness of the moment. And that's part of why we use poetry and art because it is somebody reminding us of the appreciation of the simplest thing as a bowl of fruit or light coming through a window pane or something like that. I mean, what Matisse or Gauguin can do to remind us, it's quite incredible. I have a feeling that the spiritual path tends to get, people tend to get caught in treating as trivial the earth plane until they get more evolved when they see that in the earth plane is the manifestation of God and the mother as well, that it's the mother manifest. And then they begin to reverence it and just treat it with reverence. I mean, when you're around uh, um, American Indians who are steeped in their own tradition, they walk on the earth with reverence. You can feel that the way they walk on the earth. And when they do that, it reminds me about what's happening. And it's such a gift to be reminded that way. So we remind each other, we help each other do that. We move through life so much in our minds, in our thoughts, that we lose the process because we're so busy focused on the product. I mean, the driving to Brighton Bush is as much as the getting to Brighton Bush. The walking back to your cabin is as much as getting to the cabin. There's a whole quality of learning how to stop into the moment. I have a little exercise I often do of just stopping to appreciate just what's happening at this moment. I'm driving along and I just start to, I try all the different levels of appreciation at this moment. Well, here I am, 58 years old, driving my car here and I feel a certain way and this is what's happening. Oh, that's interesting. And then I move it out a level and then down a level and I keep moving levels of describing what's going on. 
and the thing gets so thick. I mean, the moment gets so thick because each plane is another richness. It's like baklava, you know. <laughs> it's all those planes of, you know, and everyone has nuts in it. <laughs> mm. Questions? That's it? Uh, I've just come to see that a beautiful practice is whenever you notice yourself judging in the sense of identifying with the judgment, to just flip it into appreciation. To just go from judging into appreciation. And I've trained myself now so that now a good percentage of the time, certainly not all of it, I get lost a lot, but still a good percentage, significantly more than used to be, the judging, I can feel the heaviness of the place that judging comes from. I'm, I feel the cottonness of it. And the minute I feel that, instead of, oh, shit, I'm judging, I immediately turn around and take that same thing and appreciate it. So that those of you that had problems with parents, and one of the things about appreciating is appreciating exactly what they were caught in and how they ended up being what they were. Because when you look at somebody and you say, you, sh you did that to me, when you stand back a moment, they didn't do it to you. They did it because that's who they are. And, and there's a certain point where the whole responsibility shifts in drama. And where you realize that when you look at a soul coming into life with, with a curriculum that involves other people doing things to it, you realize that the soul is using the other person to do it to itself. Now, this is a very tricky issue because at the misunderstood level, it's you're responsible for your cancer, which people hear as personality, and unfortunately, it really wipes them out. It's a very harsh thing. From a soul's point of view, the soul is creating the curriculum. And in, so in that sense, when your parent has abused you, they were just doing what they were doing because they were out of control because of their desire systems, which are the results of their parents, and on, 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 and on. And you, from a soul's point of view, were using them to do that to you because that's what you needed in your curriculum. Now, that's a heavy-duty spiritual interpretation that sounds like gross rationalization from somebody that doesn't understand those other dimensions. And it doesn't mean it's a justification for not helping anybody or stopping it. But at the same moment, it is a way of looking at the people that have been involved in your life so that you can finally get free of the judging of your parents and the judging of the people around you as they didn't love me, they hurt me, they, he left me, all of those things, that, that stuff. Because you begin to appreciate that, especially in relationships which are things you enter into as a conscious being, or more or less as an unconscious being, you begin to see the way in which at a deeper level you already knew the handwriting on the wall of how it was all going to come out. Somebody said, I went in and then he left me and I was so shocked. Had you listened carefully... The seeds of all of it were in there, and that's the same way that gurus understand the future. Because they understand all the seeds, that it's all lawful, so there's no surprises. The law was already there. It's all written in each human being. And then they get in, they're constantly surprised because they were caught in their desire system which clouded their minds so they couldn't hear the truth of the situation. You've all seen it in other friends where you see somebody getting out of a relationship where it was very destructive and then you watch them get into another one that's going to be equally destructive and they're in the, oh, it's so beautiful and this will be altogether different and you know it's going to, and when you're doing the same thing all the time, we are constantly using the universe around it to do it to us. And this isn't to be blamed to the personality because that's just the, the thing itself. From the soul's point of view, you get to appreciate that each person's just living out their drama. And then they're interacting, and those interactions are the grist for each other's mill of awakening. 
from a soul point of view, you develop appreciation. From a personality point of view, you develop judgment. You feel had at the personality level. You feel appreciative from the soul level. So I would say that every time you judge and get caught in it, that's, the, you, that's a good thing to remind you. You just lost the flick to the up level of consciousness and use it to flick back up. Use it to flick out again into, yeah. When, especially when you're judging yourself. Like I was fatigued. Sorry, I was fatigued. I was tired. I wasn't very conscious. And I went away feeling badly that I had let you down. Okay. Now, there's judgment. I started walking back the path. I felt, boy, am I caught in my judging mind about myself. And then I slowly just saw this guy walking down the path, judging himself. How poignant he is. You know? He's just that old guy doing that thing again. Ah, there he is. And I began to appreciate him. By the time I got back to my cabin, I was ready to go to sleep. Yeah. Okay. Questions? Hi, Ramdas. Um, this is basically one question, but it's phrased two ways, and you can kind of pick which like, you should like best. And it's how do we strike a healthy balance between mindfulness practice that we do daily and play? And, uh, and its second form is how do we practice awareness and at the same time um, that, that witness space of awareness and at the same time develop and enjoy spontaneity? Uh, if you notice the level of evolution of the different students of uh, meditation, you will notice that there are certain stages in their development where play is gone and where spontaneity is gone because they are so, they're still learning the technique and they are so careful to be very aware of everything because they're using it as in a, in a formal way to take them in deeper. Then what happens is when the practice starts to work, you see people becoming mindful. They are mindful in a very light way. And it's like, um, I have a friend, Joseph Goldstein, and some of you, he to me is, I think, the highest meditation teacher in the United States at the moment, in terms of a Westerner. And Joseph is extraordinary. And he is one of the lightest people I know. He's just like a feather. He's just light, and we play all the time together. And yet, all the play, there is very clear mindfulness in it. It is not like you have to lose yourself in, lose your mindfulness into play. In fact, play can become a new level of delight when you are playing and you're also aware you're playing. And you're aware together that you're playing. I mean, it's just levels upon levels upon levels. And uh, I'm just enjoying the increased richness of the play with more conscious beings. It gets... Because um, it's like, the, like humor, for example. Um, uh, I've just started to get to know, um, as a friend, Robin Williams. And I feel in him a quality of compassion that colors his humor. And he can be very sharp, but the sharpness doesn't hurt in the way. It is a healing kind of humor. And it's a humor that is... A mindful kind of here. It's coming from a, another kind of space of awareness. And I've been very interested in the difference between the kind of um, Las Vegas humor, which wounds, and the kind of compassionate humor like a Will Rogers or people like that, that keeps bringing people into a, a lighter, clearer space. So I'm learning that there is play and fun that isn't divisive, that is unifying. And... Uh, but there are stages in spiritual practice where people get really, quote, serious about it. And that is going to be honored because it's necessary for that to happen before you can get the techniques learned well enough to have them pay off so you can get light again. It, you will notice in every tradition you will see students go through the fanaticism stage. They've got the only way and everybody else is an asshole who's not doing it. And they feel terribly sorry for them. 
And you've just got to be very compassionate for them. I mean, I face that in every religious tradition I've met thus far. And then when you meet a real mensch in any of the traditions, you know, a real evolved one, they know that every people get there by all kinds of paths. You know, and then they're much lighter about their way. I think that most people have to, yes. I think you start out kind of dilettante like I am, and then you kind of finally get pulled into a method. And when you get into the method, you really got to play it. You can't screw around with it. You got to really do it. And it, it takes really a commitment. And during that time, you can't really be spacious and about all kinds of methods. You got to just do your method. And in order to bring the juice to doing it, you really have to sort of see it as the way to do it, because it can't be just one way, it's got to be the way. And then, as it, the way pays off, then you get like Ramakrishna, who could make each way the way. All right, but that's a stage. More questions? Uh, on our first night here, uh, together, you talked about that um, when, being in the, when in the presence of someone you love, or in the presence of the beloved, there is no words, uh, there is just beingness. And I would like to know more about the language of being there. Well, in a way, that line doesn't um, work, the language of beingness, because language itself is, um, is the finger pointing at the moon, and the moon is the beingness. And so every time you're using language, you're always, um, in a way, again, one thought away from the, the state of being. The minute you think about it, it's not the same thing. It's, it's, uh, it's slight separation. Beingness, um, we can talk about conditions for beingness. Beingness, where boundaries break down. When you say, I am everywhere, or everywhere I am, or I am nobody, therefore I am everything. Um, beingness starts with listening into the universe. And then the listener disappears into the listening, and there is just uh, the quality of the air in the room, and the quality of the movements of the bodies, and the quality of the states of emotional being in everybody here, and the qualities of um, quietness and reaching to understand. And as we all keep opening and opening in these silences, we start to be all of this all at once. We are the heaviness of the air, we're the changing weather, we are the, we are the end of the retreat, we are the, we are the softness and sweetness we've tasted with one, one another, we are the risks we've each taken, we are, you can feel how it keeps we keep expanding into the qualities of the fullness of the moment. And uh, as long as you are the listener, you're still separate. So the listening is what starts the process. And then in a way you listen, you turn your skin inside out, you listen yourself into it until there is just what is. It just is what is. And at that moment, the term relationship disappears because you are no longer separate from that which you love. The, the quality of awareness permeates all of it and the identity with that awareness makes all of us share the same exact space. So we know each other from inside here rather than from knowing you as an object. It's a a quality where, like, when I sit with Maharaji, I can sit with the pictures and remember the form 
And then I can sit with the feeling of his presence in the room, like you're in a dark room and you know somebody's in there, but you can't see them. And then if I keep getting quieter and quieter, which now and then happens, it's as if there's a merging, not that he became me or I became him, but that we became it. That the identity of the forms dissolved. It's like the stuff, all of this stuff keeps dissolving into awareness. It keeps dissolving into this substance. When you study physics uh, and you get into the more and more um, into quantum mechanics and into quarks and so on, if you keep getting down and down and down, you get to a stuff that is common to everything in the universe. And it's only the patterns of that stuff that determine form. And that stuff is moving, it's in everything, so that the stuff that's in the star is then in your body, is in the air, is in the, is in the, and it's all one stuff, and it's all moving all the time. And it's just the patterning of that for a moment. And the patterning keeps changing, that keeps giving something a, a solid look. And in a way, that's the closest physical analogy, and that's still right on the edge of theoretical, not actually measurable, unseeable. You don't see that. You just, you theoretically infer it. The quality of that is the same thing as awareness. And in that sense, the... I used to have a camera for a while. It was stolen, but it was a, a movie camera. It was a Bolex, I think. And what you could do was you could take a movie of a tree, and then you could wind the film back, and then take another movie, like of somebody walking towards you. And then it would look like the person just walked out of the tree. And you could play with these double images just by rewinding the film and shooting it again. And I did a whole movie. I had a wonderful time with this movie because it was the closest to the way in which I experience um, the way in which we come into being, where all of the finite boundaries that our mind keeps focusing on kept dissolving until everything was all interrelated with everything else and coming in and out of it. And as long as you're focusing on your seeing mind, your seeing and thinking, Everything keeps having discriminative preciseness. You are you and I am me. But it's just like when we close our eyes and just experience the space. But then we have our ears and I just heard that cough and that cough was there, not here. I remember working with a woman who was dying and she said to me, Ramdas, she said, it's all too much too much. She says, the light's too much, the sound's too much. And I said, well, Jean, what do you say? Let's do an exercise. Let's expand outward together. And everything you hear or feel, experience it as inside of yourself, not outside. And we heard the children playing outside, and I said, hear the children? And she nodded, and I said, they're inside us. Hear the clock ticking? And I saw her fingers working with the counterpane. I said, do you feel the, the quilt? Feel that feeling inside of us. And it just kept expanding outward, expanding outward. It's a form of, of meditative yoga. And pretty soon everything, you've just expanded your boundaries. The term too much is because you have a finite container and then you're pushing against everything. When you expand outward to incorporate everything, you just keep expanding and then it's all just being and there's no boundary any longer. And she kept expanding outward and you could see all the muscles of her face releasing and relaxing, just the softening into being. And then she sat up and we hugged and kissed. And then a few hours later she died. Is that the last of the questions? 
Uh, do you know about my visit with the dolphins? Well, let me tell you the story, because I think it would be, you'd like that. Uh, I was invited to swim with some dolphins by some friends of mine who were working with the dolphins, training the dolphins to think or talk or something. And so my friend and I came to this big tank and there were these two beautiful dolphins named Joe and Rosie. And I got on the platform and then I got into the water and started to tread water, you know, swimming. And the dolphins went by me very fast. But I just sat there, stood there, swam there. And they kept going by me like this. They were figuring me out. And finally, one of them came and just stayed right here, just right in the water like this. So I reached out to touch it. And I assumed that it would swim away when you touch it like a fish. If you touch the fish, it'll swim away. And I touched it and it didn't move, it just stayed there. So I rubbed my hand down its body and it was so soft. It was like almost all water. It's like, uh, it's just like silky, very soft. And I started to rub its body. And I knew that it was letting me do that. And it was such an intimate space between me and the dolphin. We were having such, it was so soft that at that moment I just relaxed because all the time my mind was thinking, now what do you do with dolphins? <laughs> no. But then I just softened, and the minute I felt this, it, it's as if the dolphin healed me, and the dolphin relaxed me, and I relaxed completely. And at that moment, the dolphin, Rosie, turned, and she came upright, and she came up and pressed herself against me. Um, and I found myself hugging her and kissing her right on the mouth. And I went into ecstasy and I kept saying, oh, Rosie, Rosie, Rosie. And then I began to think maybe this wasn't proper. I mean, she was a dolphin and, you know, like... <laughs> and everybody was watching and I was like thinking, I'm not sure this is legal even. So then Rosie... <coughs> swam around and she came up under my arm and um, I uh, thought what I'd really like to do is swim with her and so I grabbed the fin again and we went down and again my hand lost hold came back up finally I thought what I'd like to do is hold the fin with this hand and put this hand under her but that seems like it's a little unfair you know to grab her like that but I'll do it anyway so I grabbed her and we started to swim together, and she was very wild, and I thought, well, it's bothering her, so I let her go. So I let it go, and came up to the surface, and she came right into my arm again, see? So I figured, she's telling me it's okay. So I grabbed hold, and we went swimming wildly under the water, just wildly around the tank. And then I started to lose my breath, you know, because we were underwater. And I said, well, uh... You know, she's a dolphin. It's one thing for her, but I'm a human. I got to breathe. And just as I thought that, she understood my thoughts and she came to the surface and waited for me to get a breath. And then we went down again and we swam. And then when I was needed a breath again, she came to the surface and waited for me. And we swam some more and we swam for about 40 minutes. <laughs> 